Hey everyone, Wolf Lord Roo here. Today we kick off our week special focus on the traitor Primarch Lorgar. For me, a Primarch who has quite possibly had the best character evolution of the heresy, and a Primarch who definitely divides opinion. Now, I've never particularly been a fan of the Word Bearers Legion, but the Primarch himself I find absolutely fascinating. And so I'm really excited about diving into his character, really getting to grips and understanding what shaped him, how and why he became the Lorgar we know today, and how perhaps he is very misunderstood. And there's only one place to begin, at his beginning, with his upbringing by Kor Faron. Undoubtedly the time that would define Lorgar's life far more than any other. So, spoiler warning to begin, as the events we're discussing today are from the Horus Heresy Primarch series novel, Lorgar, Bearer of the Word, by author Gav Fulp. As always, I really recommend you read the stories for yourself first, without spoilers as that's the best way to enjoy the lore for yourself. But with that said, let's just jump straight in. Like all of his brothers across the galaxy, Lorgar would be torn from terror and flung across space. He would come to find himself upon the world of Colchis. Now, Colchis was a vast, dry and arid world, dominated by huge deserts and mountain ranges. Its population mostly congregated into its various cities, all of which were controlled by a ruling religious institution known as the Covenant. The religion of the Covenant? Worship of the so-called Great Powers. Cain, Tezen, Slanet, and Narag. Not quite the ruinous powers we recognize, but the similarities are clear. Slavery was rife across cultures too, and the populace outside the controlling cities were classed as the declined, those scorned by the powers to live a life of hardship deserving of their unfortunate fate. These people largely left to live out their lives and try to survive in simple tribes. And it was to one of these tribes that Lorgar was found and taken in. Maybe, had Lorgar had a simple life amongst these struggling tribes, a future Primarch may have emerged more akin to the humble Korax in nature, who too was raised amid slavery. However, it wasn't to be. Still barely a child, Lorgar's tribe was visited by the wandering caravan of Kor Faron. And thus began the event that would define Lorgar's life forever. Kor Faron was, in essence, a religious preacher for the powers, who had been outcast from the Covenant for declaring they should be more forceful in making the rest of the world embrace the powers. Since then, he had travelled the deserts with a caravan of loyal followers and slaves, spreading the word and worship to the tribes, self-titling himself the bearer of the word, all the while plotting his revenge against the Covenant who had cast him out. For to know Corferon, you must know one thing above everything else. Everything he does Everything is motivated to further his own power. As it was on visiting one particular tribe, Corferon encountered Lorgar. The tribe had attempted to hide the small child, yet upon laying eyes on Lorgar's violet eyes, Corferon immediately realized there was something special about him, and more importantly for Corferon, quite possibly the means for revenge against the Covenant. And so Corferon took Lorgar from the tribe, 
to instill him in the teachings of the powers. Now, Lorgar was not taken against his will. Despite still but a child, Lorgar had already realized he was different from the tribe around him. And in hearing Corferon's sermon, he wished to learn more of these so-called powers. Feeling if he did so, it may help him understand who he himself was and why he was so different. And so began Lorgar and Corferon's relationship. Now, of course, Lorgar isn't alone in having been raised by a mortal parent, if you will. Rebute Gilliman was raised by Connor Gilliman, who instilled him in the ways of McCrag, for example. However, while Lorgar would equally be shaped and defined by these early years, whereas Connor was motivated by the best thing for Rebute, Corferon, by comparison, was only ever motivated by what was best for himself, to further his own power. And if you want to understand how and why Lorgar became the later Primarch, the man he would, you need look no further than this upbringing. And it began immediately. Wanting the existence of Lorgar kept secret, Corferon had the tribe who had found him and taken him in, slaughtered. And despite claiming Lorgar as his pupil, he confined Lorgar to live with the slaves. And right here, from this very beginning, as Lorgar is introduced to the slaves he will live with, there's one simple question from Lorgar that reveals just how innocent, how naive he was. Will the texts explain what I am? Corferon promised that I will learn the truth. I think that means I will learn what I am. I know I am not a child of humans. I saw the infants of the declined, and they are not like me. Lorgar may be a Primarch. He may be able to hear every conversation on the caravan. However, the truth is he's simply longing for understanding. A place to belong as any young human instinctually desires. Will the text explain what I am? The problem, the answer Nairo, the slave, gives Lorgar, is if any man could help decipher the meaning of the powers, and thus help Lorgar find that understanding, it is core Pharon. And so all of that naive, trust of the young Primarch got placed in to Corferon, the worst thing that could ever have transpired. Over the days, weeks and months ahead, Lorgar's tutelage in the powers beneath his master would begin. The first lesson, in Lorgar asking if he was to learn to read, he instead received a backhanded slap from Corferon which, though didn't leave much of a mark on the Primarch, the shock, tearful eyes and quivering lip revealed the true emotional pain. And this would be a constant. Another time receiving lashes for simply repeating the words of the text Corferon had read to him, Lorgar simply wishing to impress his master, instead punished for it. And this treatment continues throughout Lorgar's tutelage. Constant, brutal punishment. And despite the brutal treatment, Lorgar still grows to view Corferon as his father figure. And why wouldn't he? He's the only one he has. The man who is instructing him in the world. Yet calling him father results in yet another scolding and punishment helping his fellow slaves with their duties another. We speak a lot of the harsh upbringings of some of the Primarchs, and rightly so. 
the lion alone in the wilderness of Caliban, Angron the slave fighting for survival upon Nuceria. And yet Lorgar is rarely mentioned. No, perhaps his upbringing was not quite the same physical life or death situation of some of his brothers. But it was harsh. It was brutal. And in many ways, far more psychologically damaging than the instinctive black and white fight for survival of L. Johnson. As for Lorgar, any innate emotional outreach was punished and instead directed to the worship of the powers. Honestly, when you see how Lorgar was raised by Corferon, you understand perfectly how and why he developed that incessant desire, that need to have that higher power to look to, to follow. It was ingrained in him from the very start. Every emotional outreach was punished and redirected to the worship of the powers. How prophetic or simply fantastic writing by the author Gav Fulp that that kind of situation and behaviour could be perfectly symbolised by the later raising of Monarchia. Lorgar, in his worship, in his love for his father, the Emperor of Mankind, is instead once again punished for it with the raising of his greatest city. The Emperor, although inadvertently, replicating the exact behaviour of Kor Pharon. And where does Lorgar inevitably turn in that situation? What does he revert to? The powers. As he spent his life before the coming of the Emperor doing. It's absolutely fantastic symbolism and writing. There is a theory that Lorgar planned the heresy from the very beginning, even that from the moment he emerged from the warp, everything he did was to achieve that goal, arising from some later thoughts of Corferon. And we'll ask that question at the end of the week after discussing more of the pivotal moments of Lorgar's life. Yet for me, it does a bit of an injustice to Lorgar's tale, the truly human story he has, the tears he shed in every punishment. Because again, the pain wasn't truly physical for the Primarch, it was emotional. In another moment with his fellow slaves, there's a line that sums it up perfectly from Lorgar. It does not hurt. Not there. My soul is injured, Nairo. The ache is in my heart. And so the question is, why did Lorgar put up with it? As he grew more and more into the demigod warrior he was created to be, why not eradicate Corferon? Well, for me, there's a moment that explains that perfectly too. As Lorgar grew and his gifts became ever more impossible to deny, the bodyguards and servants of Corferon refused to punish Lorgar anymore at Corferon's command, believing Lorgar clearly to be the chosen of the powers. And so a mutiny occurred, some wishing to simply follow Lorgar, some to exile Corferon, others to kill him. Yet it was Lorgar who stood up to save his master. You were thrown out of the Covenant for your mad schemes, Corferon, laughed Engi, one of those holding the preacher. Do you not always say that nothing passes but for that within the design of the powers? If the powers deem that your unworthy existence should continue, why have they not intervened? We stand beneath their gaze, but where is their hand? 
what saviour will they send you? They have sent me. All eyes turned at Lorgar's quiet pronouncement. Many of the converts shuffled uncomfortably. Several brought up their weapons. Axata stepped forwards, hands raised, one to Lorgar and the other to the rest of the converts, as though holding back two pugilists. Others had come aboard, bringing their vehicles in, either at some prearranged signal, or simply noticing that all was not well on the temple rig. The deck was becoming quite crowded, and Nairo could see other slaves peering up through the gratings. Let us not do anything hasty, brethren and sistren, the chief convert said forcefully. Lorgar, this is for the best. Corferon has been poisoning your mind. Unhand my father. Lorgar took a step, and there was nothing aggressive in his demeanor. But the converts retreated from him, as though he pushed them back with his presence. Your father. Torsja grabbed hold of Corferon and forced the noose over his shaven head. If you have a father, we left his corpse in that mongrel nomad camp. And that is the root of it. For all the punishment, for all Lorgar being a genetically created demigod general, he was still human. And as with all the Primarchs, they are governed by their humanity the most. Their emotions. Lorgar viewed Corferon as his father. Even despite being punished for calling him it previously, you simply can't shut off those emotions. And they govern the Primarchs most of all, as we have seen throughout the entire Heresy series. This is not Lorgar literally saying the ruinous powers have sent him. This is Lorgar simply stating he will defend his father. If you want to kill him, you'll have to go through me. Now, Lorgar would kill several of the rebels, let's say, before being chided by Corferon for letting the rest go. And he is sent into the desert to track down the rest of them, which he does. He's gone for several days, but when Lorgar ultimately returns alive, covered in the dry blood of the slain, it's clear this is a moment of ascension, if you will. Almost like a rite of passage. Like a coming of age. The inner Primarch part of Lorgar is clearly awoken. And I'm not talking powers here or anything like that. Just in nature. That there's this part in Lorgar in committing this act that realises what he's meant to be. The leader of men. The warrior. And Corferon sees it too. In the man before him. The subtle change in Lorgar's eyes. Yet, this is the masterstroke of Pharaon's calculating nature. Realising he has to adjust his position to retain power, he immediately publicly voices the powers making their will known. That Lorgar is the new bearer of the word. A time of testing, I have said before. All of us must undergo it be it as master or slave or convert, or acolyte. Our doubts made manifest, our enemies both real and phantasmal laid before us. The powers have no need of the weak, they reward the strong. As I have shown the path to the truth while I wandered the unforgiving sands, so Lorgar has placed himself before their immortal gaze proving his worth and writing his faith with the blood of our foes. Corferon's hesitancy had gone, his voice now strident once more. He thrust the book towards Lorgar, who looked at it with surprise and bafflement for a moment before he took it. It has been made clear to me that I tread a different path from now. My present course is run, 
though I shall remain your guide in all matters of faith, a new messenger has been delivered to us. Corferon smiled at Lorgar, and, anticipating what was to come, Lorgar beamed back, his joy infectious. His excitement seeped into Nairo, to the delight of the slave. Even as the rational part of his mind screamed in despair, as Corferon's grip on the boy took a new and even more dangerous turn. Subtly, Corferon places Lorgar in the new position of power, realizing he can no longer retain it even if he tried. Yet, very calculatingly, in the same breath, retaining that symbolic position over the Primarch, as his guide in the faith. The man above for Lorgar to always look to. A position he retains still, to this day, 10,000 years later, within the Legion. Corferon truly is one of the most despicable, yet sublimely calculating people in all of the lore. From there, Lorgar's journey would continue, his conquest and unity of Colchis. His visions would come of the Golden One coming, and his slow belief that this one would be the one to change everything embracing the worship of the One. A worship Corferon of course never truly embraced, even secretly allowing opposers of Lorgar's One worship to escape on Colchis, to continue worshipping the original powers. However, for all the future actions to come of Lorgar, for me the root of it all can be traced back to these earliest of years. These ingrained teachings, Lorgar's very way of life, the constant emotional rejection, the turning to the powers, the higher power, the guidance, something inadvertently replicated later by his true father, the Emperor. And all of it tied back to one simple thing, the selfish manipulations of Corferon. But as always everyone, what do you think? Considering Lorgar was taken beneath Corferon's sway so early in his life, do you feel there was ever a way the true Primarch he was supposed to be could have still existed? Could Lorgar ever have achieved the role the Emperor intended for him? Or do you feel him being raised upon Colchis doomed him from the start? Considering Lorgar was so completely immersed in the worship of religion, why do you feel the Emperor didn't take stronger actions until Monarchia? Why did he let it go so far? And do you feel the heresy was always only a matter of time, considering the Emperor's desire to rid humanity of religion? Should maybe Lorgar have been the only Primarch who was told the truth of the ruinous powers. As always everyone, leave your thoughts in the comments below. Huge thank you to all my subscribers, your support truly means a lot to me, it really does. If you're new, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. And if you enjoyed this particular vid, then why not drop a like on it too. But with that said, I am off, and I'll see you all again tomorrow, as our conversations on Lorgar continue.